k-means clustering. And as I said already in the introduction, k-means clustering is probably one of the most popular clustering algorithms that you can find, um, or most frequently used. It's again quite easy to implement. Um, you have, have to optimize this approach a little bit if you are interested in having a very fast approach. So in the, let's say, naive implementation, which is kind of easy to realize, k-means is not necessarily the fastest technique. Let's see, how, what are the key ideas of k-means? How does it work? So the key ideas are is we have clusters, and a cluster is represented by what is called a centroid. <clears throat> a centroid is simply a point in space. It's nothing else. But this point doesn't need to be one of the original data points. So if I have, for example, a general points in the 2D plane, say I have kind of a number of points over here. And I want to express that those points form one cluster. Then the cluster is represented by a centroid, which is kind of the blue cross over here. This one. And this is typically the average location of all those points, at least in k-means. So this blue cross is not a, not, not a point which belongs to the original data set. So the original data set are only the, the white crosses over here. And the blue one is my centroid. So this is the centroid. And the white one are the original data points. And the blue one, the blue location can, of course, be a data point, but doesn't have to be. Okay, what I now have, I have a large number of those data points. Let's say all scattered all over the place. Not all over the place, but let's simply draw a couple of them. like this. And what we now try to do, what Kimmins tries to do is find a number of centroids to represent this data well. So let's say one good centroid location may be over here, one good maybe over here, that may be a good one, and maybe here. And then we may have some points which are outliers which I may not consider, or maybe those guys could also be individual centroids. So the outcome of my k-means algorithm would be to, to turn all those blue data, uh, all those white data points, generate clusters for them, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I would have seven clusters. So k equals seven. That's where the mean k-means comes from. So the goal is we have the white data points, and we say, okay, let's say k should be seven, place the best seven blue spots uh, or locations or centroids over there so that they represent the data as good as possible. So that's our task. Given our data points, given a number for k, where should those k be? Task clear? Is it clear why it is clustering? K-means assumes K is given. We come to that point later. But for the moment, assume K is given. So I, as a designer, or God tells me K equals 7. That's easy. We don't have to argue about that. <coughs> or if someone tells me K equals 7, and the question is just now, where should I put those 7 Ks? So 7 centroids. My 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's a task that we want to do. And the idea is that all the points are assigned to one cluster or to the closest cluster. So all those points will be the elements of this belong to this cluster. This, all those points in this circle will belong to this cluster. Those guys here will belong to this one. Here, here, and here. So this is the idea that all the data points in general, in the standard k-means, all the data points are assigned to one centroid. And this centroid represents all those points. And typically, at least in the standard approach, this centroid over here is the mean 
location of all the white points. Of course, you can now argue, okay, a certain number of points may be outliers, so I say, mm, these two points here may be outliers, so in reality, that's my cluster. That's something we can debate about or argue about, but for the moment, we say every of the white data points is assigned to one centroid. Okay? Okay, how does this approach work? Let's start with an informal description of the algorithm. So we have an iterative procedure, and we start, and at the initialization, we say, okay, simply choose k random locations. So I draw completely random locations all over the space here, seven. I said, okay, that's my starting point. Quite likely that was a bad choice or not representing our data very well, but that's our starting point. And then it's an iterative procedure which we continue until convergence, so until nothing changes anymore. And I say, okay, I, I kind of go through all the um, white data points, so all the white points, all the data points, and say, okay, what's the closest centroid for this data point? So in this case, it will be this one, this one, this one, this one over here, based on my random initialization. So I have an assignment of my data points to centroids. I said, okay, now let's recompute those centroids as the mean of all the data points contributing to it. So I compute a new location for the centroid. So if I'm, for example, in this example over here, and I have not too many white points here, this centroid would actually move here. So in the next iteration, this centroid would sit here. Because the mean of this one, two, three, four points, for example. And I continue this process. And this may lead to the fact that some data points are now reassigned to a different cluster. And I basically repeat this process until the association of data points to centroids doesn't change anymore. So this is the main loop. It consists of two key steps. Assign each data point to the closest centroid. And then, at least if, the, if this data association has changed, if it stayed the same, I'm, I'm basically done, I'm converged. But as long as this data association changes, I need to recompute the centroid location as the mean of the data points assigned to them. Okay? Idea clear? Okay. Let's derive now our formal algorithm. Or let's try to write that down in a more formal way. So our input is k and our data points. So this is our data points, whatever form 1 to n and data points and not, not k, sorry, k, not dk, my, the number of clusters that I want to have. Okay, now that m, mi are my centroids. Centroids. Those are those which I want to generate. The first thing I can do is I randomly initialize them. So whatever, for all i, so this means, oh, let's write it down. For i equals 1 to k, I say mi equals rand, random initialization. I randomly put them somewhere in space. Of course, the data points are whatever m-dimensional. This is an m-dimensional number, but just kind of, just should illustrate this, just a random initialization. Okay. Then I have a loop while not converged. So what happens? What are the two things that I need to do now? Mm -hmm. and then assign it to the centroid with the, with the minimum distance. Exactly. So let's use an indicator variable for that. Let's say whatever. B, I for my data point, whatever, N. So data point N should be assigned to cluster, sorry, just make the indices right, then we use the same verb as I. 
So this is 1 if data point n is assigned to cluster number i and 0 otherwise. So this takes the value of 1 of 0 and it takes the value of 1 exactly in which situation? So this, is, this should be the correspondence variable. It should be 1 if data point n is assigned to centroid i. Okay. So this is the fact if the distance of m of t n, so the nth data point, minus the i centroid is minimal. Uh, okay, to rewrite that, that was suboptimally written. If i equals to argmin over all i's of xn minus mi. Okay? So if n is assigned to i, if data point n is assigned to cluster i, this value takes, uh, this indi indicator variable takes a value of 1 and 0 otherwise. Okay. Why have I done this indicator variable? Use the same trick that we used last week um, in the, or two days, no, day before yesterday for introducing LDA. We have this kind of indicator. In, um, index variables or correspondence variables, which we now can use to actually recompute the location of the centroids. And of course we do that for all n. Compute this for all n, for all data points. What we then can do is, again, for all data, uh, for all clusters, for all i, we need to recompute the centroid locations, right? And that's quite easy now. Mi should be the mean of all data points associated to the centroid. That's simply the sum over all data, oops, over all data points, n, of my point xn, but I only want to take those which are assigned to cluster i. So times B N I. Because they take the value of 1, if this is the right one I want to use, and it's 0 otherwise, so they cancel out. Since I'm interested in the mean, I have to divide that by the number of data points which are actually associated to the centroid, which is simply the sum of all index variables. Because they are 0 if they're not assigned, then they don't count, or they are 1 if they are assigned to it. And that's it, I'm done. Of course, I still need to make the decision of convergence, but this can typically be done quite easily. I can simply do this if this assignment doesn't change. If the assignment stays the same, then the mean computation would stay the same and nothing would change. And then I'm actually done. Okay, is this idea clear? The algorithm clear? Excellent. So, it's kind of a small step through that. This is everything, just what I explained on the blackboard is written here on the slides. And we end up with this algorithm, which we do that. We initialize this randomly. We go over all data points. This is here what's written for all n. We make this assignment. And then we recompute the mean until it converges. So it's written slightly different than I've written on the blackboard. I was a little bit shorter, but this is exactly the corresponding algorithm for that. Okay, so let's see how this works, how, this, how does it work in practice. We start here, <coughs> we have these green data points, this is my collection of data points, and I now say k equals 2, I want to find the two clusters of data, of data points. So we have the blue one and the red one, in the beginning they are randomly initialized, one here, one there, and the data points are colored all in green because they haven't been assigned to any of those centroids. From all the following plots on, you will see that the points are either blue or red, and this is just indicating which is the closest centroid for that point. So basically, the color is this index variable over here. Okay, in the first step, everything 
which is closer to the blue one gets blue, everything which is closer to the red one gets red. So this is kind of the separating line. This is what we have. So it's just the assignment. This is just kind of the computing the index, the indicator variables, what is was called BIN in my example. It's exactly this. Same location, no, no location has changed, just the color has changed. And then we do the next step. We need to recompute the mean for both of, for the red cross and for the blue cross. And this is what happens here. So if you compute the mean over the red points, this one moves in this direction, and for the blue one, it moves in this direction. So this is the new location of the blue cross. This is the new location of the red cross over here. Okay, now simply do that again. Do again the assignment, which points are now closer to the red one, which are closer to the blue one. So this is my new separating line. Again, from here to, from here, to here, between those two images, only the color assignment has changed. No position has changed. So this is just, again, reassigning the index variables. And then I get a new assignment, and then I recompute the mean. So the blue one moves more down in this cluster, and the red one moves more in, in the direction of this cluster. Then I get another separating line. Now the difference is already getting smaller, so just a few points, those points over here have changed. Most of them stay the same. And then I continue this process. This was the assignment variables computed, and then computed again until nothing changes, and then these are my two clusters. So these are the two centroids, those crosses, after the k-mean algorithm has converged. Again, something which is actually quite easy to implement. I mean, you can actually write down the algorithm here, and this is basically a couple of, of loops and if then else statements, what you do in here. There's not much more, um, not, not the higher complexity that you need to do in here. What can we say about k-means, which is good? It's quite easy to understand and quite easy to implement. So if you sit down, implement it, you can actually implement it, I don't want to say no time, but it it's re does, really doesn't take a long time. It's not a very complicated algorithm. You basically need to know loops, if statements, and how to compute a distance. That's doable. <clears throat> the question is efficiency. It's efficient. One may argue if this is efficient or not, but it's an approach which is linear in the number of iterations. N. So I, I selected N as a stupid variable here on the blackboard because here's the data points, here's the number of iterations. I'm sorry for that. Should I, I should have used T over here. That would have been in line with what's written in the slide. So by then it's, it depends linearly the number of iterations that I need to execute. I unfortunately don't know that before. The number of clusters that I have, because I have to do that for all clusters, and on the number of data points. So the more, if I have twice as many data points, the algorithm takes twice as long. If I have twice as many clusters, the algorithm takes twice as long. If I have twice as many um, iterations that I need to execute, the algorithm takes twice as long. That's what this notation O of NKT means. Yes, please. But there might be some correlation between the number of data points, for example, and the number of iterations. So it might not just be doubling, but more. Like that is true. If I keep the number of iterations fixed, so always the, the statement always holds if you keep the, the other parameters fixed. If I keep the number of clusters fixed and the number of um, iterations fixed and I just increase the number of data points, it's a linear increase. Of course, if, let's say, the number of data points and the number of iterations I need have a linear, would have a linear dependency under this assumption. I'm not claiming that. I'm just saying this to make an example. Then increasing the number of data points would lead in a quadratic increase of complexity. It would be because n would depend linearly on t, and we have t here, so it would be quadratic. That's true, if this is the case. There is some dependency, but it's unfortunately not as easy to, class it, to, to quantify that. The other thing is the algorithm actually con converges quite quickly, but typically only to a local optimum, not a global optimum. So it may not be the best assignment that I have here, but it's a local optimum. So if I rerun the algorithm with a different initial guess configuration, I may end up with a different clustering. There's different centroids. Because we're only looking into an algorithm which is guaranteed to converge, but it only converges to a local optimum, not to a global optimum. Having said that, that's not bad. What are the weaknesses of the algorithm? What is not that good about the algorithm? One comment was made in the beginning. I need to know k. So k must be known. 
What else? Yes. So that is kind of, so the, you said the circles need to be arranged in, in circles. I would slightly reformulate that and say the, both, all dimensions have the same impact on the, on the distance function. And that means I'm not treating one, one um, dimension different than another one. So if the points are spread along a line and I have multiple lines in parallel, for example, this algorithm would merge those lines rather than keeping those lines separated. That's absolutely right. Yes, please. And since it is only creating a local optimum, it all very much depends on where you start with the centroids. Exactly. The initialization of the centroids has an impact on the final result. So it's sensitive to the initial guess. Absolutely right. This holds for all local methods, unfortunately. Mm. Oh, most of them. It's a local method because it converts to a local solution. And as long as I have more than one local solution, I typically don't find the global one. What else? Um, no, not necessarily. You can have a large number of data points sitting so over there and just two or three points over there. They may turn into one cluster. Those points here may turn into one cluster. What is true is that there is kind of a certain relation between how far they are away from each other and how large they are. So if it's a small cluster which is close to another one, it may get eaten up by the others. But as soon as they are separated, they can be a very small cluster and can also be a very large cluster. So one of the things is I need to do a lot of um, nearest neighbor queries, so finding the minimum point. That can be actually pretty expensive computationally expensive. So saying, okay, for a point, which are the points nearby? Which is the closest one for making the assignment of data points to centroids. So I have my whatever, 50 centroids, but a million of data points, I need to do all these checks. Can be computationally expensive. What one can do, speed that up by using, for example, a KD tree, or so-called approximate nearest neighbor approaches, which do not give me the exactly the, all the n closest points, but um, just an approximate way. The speeds of the computation of k-means dramatically by orders of magnitudes and turns it into actually an efficient algorithm. But if I do kind of iterate really over all data points and doing in kind of in a naive way the comparison, is the point closer to centroid number one, two, three, four, or five, and I have to do this for all data points, it's a lot, num large number of comparisons I have to execute. There are smarter ways for doing that, there are exact ways for doing that smarter, and there are approximate ways for doing that smarter. And if you do that for a large number of data points, you typically start looking into approximate techniques. So approximate nearest neighbor queries is one of those things that one would look into if one really needs to implement that for a large number of data points. Um, so these were the so user has to specify K, the initialization matters. Maybe I even try 10 different initializations and take the best result. There's some of the things I can do. Um, oh yeah, that's something I got, forgot. The approach is sensitive to outliers. If I have a few outlier points, let's say points which are put somewhere very far away, they can completely drag away those clusters, those centroids. So it only works well for outlier free data. If I have weird outliers in there, they can actually screw it up. Or I need to have a certain outlier handling, like if I have points which are very far away from all other points, I basically ignore those points, or um, uh, if a centroid is only supported by a very small number of data points, I may delete them. So there are some techniques to handle that, but in this standard approach, as it was formulated here, the approach is actually sensitive to outliers. Okay, any other issues? <clears throat> one more issue. Most of them actually you said, even more than I had on my slides, that's great. One more issue that can happen. Sorry? Okay, um, so a lot of issues have been raised about Kmin, which is great. Um, I didn't expect to get so much feedback, but there's one further point which has not been mentioned. What could be a problem if I do that? If I apply Kmin's and I do really a random initialization in the beginning, as we did it here just by drawing a random number. Yeah. 
the, cent the centroids could be at exactly the same position. Um, yes, this can happen, but to believe I then do this. Yeah, actually, that. Yeah, it could, it's unlikely, but it could happen. Yes, but that was not the problem I was actually referring to. Exactly, they're empty clusters, empty centroids. So consider we have this situation with these two centroids as we had here, and we randomly initialized them with the clusters. One is picked somewhere in the middle, and some is picked very far away at, at, at Heiner Kuhlmann's building over there. So all the, cent all the data points will be assigned to this single centroid, and this centroid over there won't get a single data point. It will not change. It will not be updated. And we do have also a strategy on how to deal with that. So one of the things one can do is after an iteration, if a centroid has no single data point assigned to it, it's simply deleted and I initialize it at a different other location. Or, one something else, if I initialize this, I don't do that randomly. I randomly draw a K of my initial data points and assign the centroids at the data points and at least have one data point as clear supporters. These are different techniques I can actually execute and there are a couple of kind of corner cases that one needs to take into account if one implements K-means. But it was great. So we derived k-means here together. We identified basically all the, the drawbacks and all the strengths. That's, 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 really, that's really nice. I really like that. So it's, a ver it's an easy to implement algorithm, although it has some corner cases. And in order to make that really fast, you need to invest a little bit more brain power than what I've shown here. As long as we have an, kind of a guess what k could be or should be, and as long as we don't have too many outliers, um, it's actually a pretty good algorithm. And that's also the reason why it's one of the standard algorithms for general clustering problems, although it's not too often used for pixel-based clustering of images, because there are other algorithms which simply perform better. And one of them I want to present now. This is what's called mean shift clustering. And the initial examples that I have, these are results that are obtained with mean shift segmentation. So it's a quite flexible technique for doing for image-based segmentation. <coughs> and the idea is behind it, they say, we model a probability distribution over intensity values that occur. For example, intensity values. This could be, for example, here blue intensity is pretty good, pretty high. So it's a very high probability for blue. Um, there are some areas which are kind of greenish or whatever, brownish brownish over there. We say, okay, we treat all the, the points as representing samples from a probability distribution. What we now want to do is we have those samples spread over the space. Let's find the modes, the peaks of these probability distributions, and they are representing our clusters. There's an example. So I have those, this, in, this input image over here. And if I just go to, the, to one element in the color space and dot for every pixel one point over here, this is the distribution, the color, the, the, the distribution over color point that I get in a sampled way. So every point here corresponds to one pixel. What I then can do is okay, simply say this is a probability distribution in 3D, at least if I plot it for 2D, so for those two dimensions over here, and simply count how many data points I have, I kind of get off this type of terrain. But what I want to do is I want to find the modes, so those dots over here, the modes of this kind of mountains, like the, 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 the peaks of these mountains in there. Yes, please. So these are these are variants of a color space. So it's not RGB color, but it's turned into a different color space with kind of intensity values. But for, for understanding it, you can see RGB. That's, that's all fine. So there. And these are all those individual points here which, which are mapped into, this, into this, this space over here. And then, so these are just the points. And you say, I want to say, OK, given that it's here a very dark area, this is a high probability density over there for, for these states to occur. What this is, is actually the plot, just those two dimensions here, because I can't plot 3D and probability. So it's just kind of two dimensions and probability 
and we get kind of this terrain. And what we're interested in, in finding the modes in this distribution. And these are those red points over here, which would then lead to a certain clustering. And here kind of the colors represent different clusters. Because there's a different way, so if I start in any of those points, I would be dragged to that mean. So it's actually kind of a relation to the watershed segmentation, if you see that. The only thing is we are now working in the probability distribution of uh, color values that occur in here. But the thing of kind of finding the peaks or finding the watersheds, at least they, from the intuition, share some similarities. They're definitely not the same, but they share some similarities. Okay, so the key idea behind this is we take those data points and represent it as a non-parametric probability distribution. Non-parametric? Because I don't, don't fit a Gaussian or any other parametric form to that. I just take the samples as they are. Say, those samples represent a probability distribution. If I go, look to a local area, the more points which fall into this area, the higher the probability of that area. So in this area, we have a lot of points these areas with a high probability up here in areas of low probability. Okay, so this idea of a non-parametric probability or density clear? So non-parametric because we don't fit a function to it. We don't use the Gaussian or Poisson distribution or whatever we want to do to this data. We just say we take the samples, those data points as they are and simply say we look into local areas and say the more data points which fall into an area, the higher the likelihood of that area or the probability of that area. That's kind of the idea what's meant with non-parametric density. And we don't want to try to find the modes of this density. Um, okay, first thing I said is kind of I do a non-parametric estimation. And basically the question is how many data points fall into a certain region. So I define a region or a local neighborhood and I basically count the number of data points which fall into this region. And I'm interested in finding the modes of this density. And the assignments of a pixel to such, um, uh, to such a mode is simply by saying if I follow the gradient through this density function and I end up at the same mode, then the point belongs to the same cluster. So if I go back to this image here, basically I, I start from any location over here and if I end up kind of always climbing up the mountain, and if I end up here, that po all points which end up here say this is one cluster. If I start here, I may end up over here. So it's a different cluster. But so it's, kind of, it's similar to like a region of attraction that we are considering here. That's the reason why in this area, all the points which are started here in this area corresponding to this large block over here, they ended up in the mode which was somewhere over here and they all got the yellow color. Okay, but the nice thing is we can actually illustrate the, the algorithm very, very nicely with a nice animation. So consider this, we are in a 2D world, and this is our, dist our distribution of our data points. So what we now need to do is, we need to find the mode of this distribution, and then for every point, we actually need to start from this point and see at which mode we are going to end up with. So let's say we randomly start somewhere, say, okay, this is our area of interest now, start here, and now what we want to do is, we want to start from this area of interest and see where we end up, where is the next mode. So where is the kind of the next peak of the, next, of the closest mountain. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, we need to approximate the probability distribution around this point. Right? We don't have a parametric form, I said that, it's non-parametric. We basically say, what's the, what's the shape of the probability distribution given kind of this local region? One way to do this, the simplest way to do that, is simply count the number of data points which fall into this region. And then simply evaluate a different neighborhood. There are more points in this region. Oh, that's better. It's kind of going up the peak. What we can do is typically, what one typically does is one uses basically a form of weighting in there. Saying, okay, points which are further away, I actually want to estimate the density at this point. Points which are further away contribute less to this area than points which are nearer, which are closer. So this point has a higher impact than those points over here. Basically, considering the points and how far they are away, and I'm typically doing this with a kernel, or often one uses a Gaussian kernel for that. Basically, so X is the point where I want to evaluate that, this one over here. I take a sum over all points in this region, so all the points in this region, and simply say how far is 
this point, the point M away from the point I'm querying from this point under a Gaussian kernel or under a kernel and often it's a Gaussian kernel. And this gives me kind of a smooth, like a Gaussian smoothing over those points so that I have a continuous function. Okay, so let's do that again. So we have been here. This was our region of interest <coughs> for which I do all the computations. I compute the density function and then say, okay, if I, if I look to all those points over here, this area is, if I take all the points here into account, the new mean, the peak of this probability distribution. Because if I take all those points here into account, this is, in this local region, the point with the towards the higher probability mass. So what I do is I basically shift my mean from my original location, which started, to this new one, kind of I'm shifting this, is the mean, therefore the mean shift vector, I'm shifting the mean, that's where the name comes from, the mean shift algorithm. So I basically move this circle over there, and then I repeat the process. This is now my area of interest, I do again, estimate my density, I estimate the maximum, and I said, okay, the new maximum is here. Most number of data points fall there. Shift the mean there. And continue this process. And can do that again. And again. Until I kind of, con I, I kind of converge it. Okay, I'm here. Plus minus epsilon, of course. It will never end up exactly at the same point. So, okay. When I started from here, I'm, I end, I'm ending up here. And for this distribution of points, wherever I start in this space actually will end up here because this is the mode of my probability distribution. If I would have a second large number of points over here, whenever I start in this local area, I would be dragged to this mode. And for all the points which are dragged to this mode, which is not shown on the slide, but to this virtual mode, would be cluster, for example, number one, and all the other areas which correspond to cluster number two. Okay, I can also compute the mean shift, which is basically just the weighted sum of this, of this kernel minus my original position. This gives me this mean shift vector. So it's, I can easily compute this. So this is my original x, and this is kind of the, the, the new mode according to the, um, to the kernel estimator, and this gives me my mean shift vector. So again, if I have kind of two neighboring peaks, so I can see this as two mountains over here, two peaks. Whenever I start in the red area, I'm going to end up here. Whenever I start in the blue area, I'm going to end up here. And if I do that, for realistic examples, this was the example that I had before, we get kind of this distribution with a couple number of, of modes. No, something you have to provide. I'm coming to that in a second. <clears throat> um, okay, what was, what's coming up here? Okay, perfect question. So, how does the mean shift algorithm work? The first thing I need to choose, I need to choose the kernel and the bandwidth, and this is exactly kind of the, the size of my kernel. And this depends typically on the dimensionality um, that I'm looking into, so uh, on, the, on the data that I'm looking into. Do I look into RGB values, or do I have any other dimension, some feature dimension, some texture maybe I take into account? And for all of them, I have to define a neighborhood. What means close? What, what means nearby? If I put the, make this area too small, every point, or well, all those points which give an individual, uh, an individual mode, if I make them too large, most of them would actually be merged into just kind of one big mountain. And I need to have some user input, what is similar, so what, to which non-probability distribution do these number of points actually correspond to. So I choose a kernel and bandwidth, and then I do for every of all of those data points, I start with my window at that point, so this was the kind of the first circle. Start at every data point, I compute the mean shift and move towards the mode, the where I move along the mean shift vector to my new pose. And I repeat this process until the mean, mean, shift, uh, the mean shift vector is zero, so the mean doesn't change anymore, or more or less doesn't change anymore. 
And then I say, okay, I store this, this mode and I say, okay, I assign this point to this mode. Do that for every point and then I check at how many different modes did I actually end up with. Okay. So if I do that now for images, two things may, may matter. It matter once if the points are spatially very far away in the XY image. So I don't want to merge an area down in the top uh, right corner and the bottom left corner of my image just because they have the same intensity values. So position kind of matters, but also intensity values may matter. So I can actually say, okay, I turn that to a three or five dimensional space, X, Y intensity or X, Y RGB, whatever I use, to a higher dimensional space, taking account this information. And then I need to define uh, the kernel size for the position. I typically have a different one than for my feature. The feature could be color, texture, whatever I'm using. So I typically use one for the location, which say what means nearby in terms of pixels, and what means um, in terms of feature space, for example, in terms of color. And then I basically perform that and then need to make sure in the end that I do this in the appropriate way for the position and for the, for the intensity values. If I do that, I actually get pretty good results. So this is the original input image. This is what the k-means segmentation does. So we actually nicely see that, for example, all the, the green areas, the grass areas, are, are, are nicely identified as one. This one is a different green color, so this is a different class because they are simply too far away. If there would be a connection between them here, they would likely be merged into one. Um, all the streets are nicely separate. Of course, also shadows that I have over here and in a very similar way for the mountains. So I basically identify what are the areas where there's snow, where there's gravel, um, or the other types of mountains. Of course, you need to play a little bit with the, with your, with the kernel width in order to get those results. And same also for these types of images, the motivational image I had in the beginning and those kind of holiday-like uh, pictures. Um, we actually get a pretty good segmentation of what the individual areas are. So here's kind of the beach areas, um, mountains, um, trees, tree structures here, and, and the lakes itself. So in terms of the, the good and the, the bad things of mean shift algorithm, the nice thing is it's actually a pretty good and pretty flexible algorithm. The only thing I need to do, I need to define my kernel. And I'm not restricted to images. I can exploit images by saying some of those dimensions are, for example, the, the, the spatial nearness in my image and others could be texture, could be intensity values, um, whatever I use in order to define my similarity. It's pretty robust to outliers, even if I have a few outlier points which are far, which, which are far away. These are just points where um, just one single data point would be in a cluster. I can very easily identify this in my local regions and um, do not need to address it. It's not the case that they kind of ruin my assignments as in k-means if I have one data point which is very far away. So I can actually quite easily handle that. Um, but of course, I need to know my kernel size, so I need to have some idea of what kind of dimensions I'm actually looking into um, here. And um, it's not very suitable for very high dimensional features. So in very high dimensional spaces, I need to do these kernels of all the high dimensional spaces and then define all the kernels in the different dimensions that can be tricky. But for standard um, image segmentation, that's actually one of the very popular algorithms one can use. And again, it's also not too hard to implement. You can actually do that in a quite straightforward way. Which brings me to the summary of what we have done so far. So we look today completely into unsupervised techniques. I have a couple of slides looking also into supervised techniques, but I'm going to, uh, to drop that for now. Um, so that means we don't have any semantic label or data given by a user saying, hey, this is type A, this is type B, this is type C. This is not at all the case here. We just have data points without any labels, without anything. We only have a similarity function. And based on the similarity function, we want to group those um, data points into similar, data, into, into similar groups of data items. You can use this for a lot of different tasks for merging elements in an image, identifying homogeneous region in, regions in an image for analyzing images like the satellite images. Um, we may use this as a pre-processing step for further semantic analysis. We can use this to summarize data. We can use this for visualizations, for whatever, counting the number of fields in an area. For all these different tasks, we can actually apply those clustering algorithms. There are different types of clustering algorithms. Um, so mean shift, 
watershed, agglomerative clustering are techniques which are often used in image um, segmentation, especially mean shift. K-means is not so frequently used in here, but it's more frequently used as a general purpose algorithm if you don't have any further information of what you're actually seeing. So you don't have to define a kernel. Of course, intuitively, this is strongly related to assuming that the Euclidean distance is a good distance measure for your space. Again, this is an assumption, but um, k-means is kind of one of the first choices that one typically is taking into account. So that's it from my side. Are there any questions from your side? Yes, please. Ja. Mhm. Ja. Okay. So the question was if I have all those points over here. How many points do I need, especially in this, in this borderline area, to separate to which mode I'm actually ending up? That's not what I need to do. So what I need to do is every of those data points corresponds to one pixel in my original image. And I simply start that for every pixel, I simply execute my algor algorithm. And so if I start here, I end up at that mode, so I label it as red. If I'm a little bit to the right, I simply start the process, I end up here saying, okay, this is blue. And this is then automatically the border, but I'm never explicitly computing that because I'm starting for every pixel I execute this algorithm and compute this, uh, this, this mean shift towards the modes. And therefore, I don't need to represent this explicitly. Again, I have to do this for every pixel. If I have an image with a large number of pixels, this may be costly, but um, that's how the approach works. Any further questions? Okay, if this is not the case, thank you very much for your attention and hope you enjoyed this lecture. Um, with this lecture, we are basically ending the image, processing image analysis part of the lecture and we are now starting to look into geometry from now on. So, doing some repetition about homogeneous coordinates uh, in, in next week and then looking into how can we determine camera parameters, how can we determine the location of the camera if we see something in the world that we know and then kind of relaxing the assumptions step by step in the end saying we don't know where the camera is, we don't know what we see in the world, we do our observation and try to reconstruct a map of the environment and where the camera is. That's kind of the outlook from now to the end of photogrammetry too, but kind of from now or from next week on we're actually starting to look into geometry. Okay, thank you very much.